Uh, this year we're reflecting on some of the great characters who appear in, in Luke's great drama, The Acts of the Apostles, uh, which tells, the, of course, the colourful story of how the Christian message emerged from the eyewitness accounts of an obscure group of people, a hundred or so, meeting in a crowded, lamp-lit third-storey room in a Jerusalem side street. It was transformed into, into a coherent faith that irritated and provoked the Jewish establishment and caught the attention of the Greco-Roman world. And so it stepped from city to city across Asia and Europe until finally it was proclaimed before the emperor's representatives in the great city of Rome. What a ride. And I envy you, I must say, because it's such a colourful, vivid narrative. It's got such remarkable characters, both good and bad, uh, in its pages, and it's got some powerful uh, and encouraging spiritual lessons as well, and we're going to touch on some of them uh, tonight. But tonight's story about Stephen uh, starts with a problem. Now, who would have thought that that was possible? You know, the, the early community of uh, the Jesus movement, we might call it, or the way of the Nazarenes, as they were known uh, biblically at this time. Um, who would have thought that a community like this uh, would have experienced, you know, mundane, everyday problems. You know, John the Baptist had promised, hadn't he, when he foresaw what was to come. He said, as he was preaching, that there's coming one who's stronger and more worthy and mightier than I, and he's going to baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And repeatedly, Jesus reaffirmed that promise. He told the disciples, stay in the city, until you are clothed with power from on high. Wait for the promise of the Father. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me. The, you know, the promise was repeated again and again uh, by Jesus himself, and he told them as he left that they were to go into all the world and with his authority and in his power to make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That was the promise. And what an amazing promise it was. And it galvanised the disciples. They were there in that upper room for a, for a solid week, just praying for the fulfilment of that promise after Jesus had left them. And suddenly the day came. And as they were in the temple worshipping, the house was filled with a rushing mighty wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, we're told, in Acts chapter 2. And Peter goes on to explain, doesn't he, that this is what God had promised in the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit. And he held out that offer to the crowd as he holds it out to us still today. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And again and again as we make our way through the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit charging this community and the leaders of that community in order to go about uh, Jesus' work. Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit and Tonight, Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit. On other occasions, Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. Time and time again, God charged these people with spiritual energy uh, to carry forward his work. In fact, the whole ecclesia at times, they were all filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. And as Paul later said, uh, that was uh, sort of core to what God was doing. He was building a new temple of people, not of bricks and mortar. And uh, that would be a dwelling place uh, for God by the Spirit. So you'd think that in a spiritually charged community like this, how is it that they got problems? And yet uh, they did have a problem. And it revolved around pressing human needs. We read about it tonight. It was a complex of very human needs around social marginality and poverty and language differences and different cultural backgrounds and daily needs such as food and, and clothing uh, that uh, threatened to drive a wedge into this vibrant, energetic uh, Christian community. You see, um, a lot of the people who were uh, members of this Nazarene or Jesus movement, as they were then known, uh, were poor people. And they weren't necessarily living at home on their subsistence farm or you know, next door to their workshop. They were living in Jerusalem uh, because of their calling. And they were completely reliant on social networks and social systems uh, to provide them for the basics of daily life. And we see that in the, in the story of Acts, don't we? Like generous people, people like uh, 
uh, Barnabas, for example, said, oh, look, I know what I can do. You know, I've got a, a, a valuable uh, seafront property in Cyprus, and rather than sell it to a, a Russian developer and borrow money from a dodgy Cyprus bank, I will sell this property and I will donate the proceeds uh, for the benefit of my brothers and sisters. So that would be a very valuable gift. And once he'd sold the property, he took all of the money and he put it at the feet of the apostles and they then each day uh, took you know, parts of that and handed it out uh, to people whose needs they became aware of. And a system grew up of these daily distributions of food and clothing and other basic necessities, like it might be a toothbrush one day or a, a pair of uh, secondhand or hand-me-down sandals the next or uh, another garment or perhaps uh, uh, some, some bread or some uh, curry or whoever, whatever uh, was, was needed by people day to day. And people were absolutely reliant on these daily distributions for the basics. They had nowhere else to go. The social system that was run out of the temple, and that was a very elaborate system, right? They weren't going to be sharing that with members of the Christian movement. That went to Orthodox Jews. And so they were completely outside of the social support systems of their day and absolutely reliant uh, for these pressing human needs on these daily distributions. Well, where's the problem? Sounds like a good system, right? Well, have a look at chapter 6 and verse 1. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, right, good news, this is a growing movement. Every day, people are finding reasons to attach themselves to those who follow Jesus. Ah, here's the problem in the middle of the verse. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected uh, in the daily distribution. Now, what Luke is exposing here, if you like, is two distinct networks within the ecclesia in Jerusalem. There were the Hellenists and there were the Hebrews, as, uh, as my translation has it. it. might be slightly different words. It might be Greeks, for example, in your uh, translation. Greeks and Hebrews. And so what was happening, there were these two different groups of people, if you like, from two different backgrounds, and that people were falling through the cracks, so there were the Palestinian Jews, if you like, people from Galilee in the north, um, people from Judea in the south. You know, they, they often mixed. They had family connections. They lived in that land. And they're the ones described here as the Hebrews. They, they grew up there. Their roots were in that soil. They spoke the local language, Aramaic at the time. They understood, they participated in Palestinian culture. They were insiders, if you like. They were from here. And they were well connected socially. And so naturally, they were on the apostles' lists, right? When food and clothing was needed, their name was there. And so every day, regularly, uh, they were supported. But there was another group of people who were a growing number uh, within the ecclesia there in Jerusalem who were Greeks or Hellenists, who were Hellenistic Jews. And these were Jews from far and wide across the Greco Roman Empire. They could live hundreds or thousands of kilometres away. But this time the Jews had got as far as Spain and Morocco uh, in the west and right over to Babylon and into Persia on the east. Some had even got to India. So they were spread right across the then known world and, and some of these people had become believers and followers of Jesus. But they weren't from here, were they? They were from foreign parts. They looked different, Right? And naturally, as, as Jews had been there for hundreds of years, there'd been a bit of intermarriage and they might have actually physically looked different. They spoke a different language, Greek. Um, they had came completely out of Greco-Roman culture and although they were loyal Jews, you know, they understood about theatres and they understood about temples and they understood about trade. That's how they'd grown up uh, in the middle of that milieu. They were the outsiders. But in Jerusalem, they were socially marginal. And they weren't on anybody's list, right? People didn't even know their names. They hadn't heard of them. They weren't connected to anybody locally. Uh, they didn't know where they lived. Uh, they probably met uh, in, in they, they all met in these little house churches or house ecclesias, if you like. They didn't have halls. And so if they had a, a little meeting a few kilometres out of the city, nobody even knew they existed. And this was the problem that emerged inside the ecclesia at that time, these two distinct networks, and the cultural gap between the two was disrupting the distribution system and the Hellenist widows were missing out. And that meant they were going hungry, going cold, 
going barefoot. Now, this might seem like a, a straightforward problem, you know, problem solution. Sometimes we look at things mechanically like that, don't we? And we think, well, really, it can't be that hard. Uh, pretty easy to fix that one, surely, right? Not in those days. They didn't have the communication networks we do. How were they actually going to identify these people and, and get them on a list, find out where they lived, assess their needs and make sure that every day those needs were met? It wasn't quite so straightforward as it might be today to solve that problem. But what concerns me, I suppose, is if we think below the surface and we think about what this tells us about any human community, there's always the threat, isn't there, of, of uh, fragmentation, of a community coming apart, of starting to fight among itself over things that don't need to become issues. And we see a little glimpse of that human reality here. And while we might not face this specific problem, there's always the potential, isn't there, uh, for division. This might seem like a, a simple problem to solve, but the fact that it caused a major conflict in the Jesus movement illustrates the tremendous potential uh, in every human being, sadly, and every human social system for conflict. How easy it is for human beings to fall out and fight. Now, if it was true of this issue, uh, of course, it's true even of much more complex and significant disputes. And, and one of them, of course, the, the, perhaps the biggest one that threatened the whole existence of the, uh, of the community in the first century was the circumcision controversy. You know, there was a whole movement, wasn't there, within Christianity of the Judaists who, who got, were, were terrified of all these uh, Greek-speaking Gentiles coming into the ecclesia and, and changing things. You know, it's going to be different with all these people here. Listen to them. They don't even talk our language. They haven't got our traditions. They don't understand why we do what we do. And they want to change everything. And so there was this huge anxiety that grew up among the, the law-keeping Judaist Jews. And they started a movement, didn't they, within the ecclesia uh, to, to say that all of these people who've been flocking to Christ, oh, well, now they have to be circumcised and they have to keep the law of Moses and they're no longer allowed to eat pork or, or products that contain blood and, and they've got to uh, keep a, a, a large distance between themselves and uh, their Greek society, because we know that that's polluted with many evil things, and, and so on. And the list of rules and barriers to faith started to mount. You know, that, that controversy alone could have destroyed the Christian movement. It could have split it right down the middle. It could have made it a most hostile and unwelcome place for people like you and me, who are not Jewish, to be, right? And uh, Paul saw that potential and he, he stomped on it. He was determined uh, to deal with that issue. And this is his conclusion in the letter to the Galatians. Just have a look at these two quotes. You have to think that the Judaists thought, you know, God gave us these rules. Jews have lived by them for one and a half thousand years. Why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult uh, for these people who are coming to faith in Jesus uh, to keep our rules? And yet Paul, who was himself a Jewish rabbi, could say, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. You see, he refuses to take sides on the sort of the, the squabble. He says, I'm not, I'm not in this for the, the people who are arguing for circumcision and I'm not going to bat for the people arguing against circumcision either. I can tell you there is something far more important than either of those two sides to this dispute. That is... Faith working through love. That is really important. So he said far more important than that or any other argument you might like to start or jump into, just think about the principle of faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ worked out in life through a, an ethos of care and love toward other people, treating them with respect, treating them with kindness and compassion. That is far more important than picking sides in this squabble. And just so they didn't miss the point, uh, toward the end of the letter, the last few verses, he comes back to that slogan. And he says, neither circumcision counts for anything. Wow! That would have been so hard for a Jew to take, to hear those words. Ah! Nor uncircumcision, says Paul, but a new creation. Right? 
You've got to allow the Spirit of God to be creating that new creature, to be born again by water and spirit. You've got to allow the Spirit of God to nurture that creature and to drive the sap through that tree so that the fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and all the other fruits of the Spirit are abundantly present uh, in your life. That is what matters, says Paul. Now, we do well to remember that, wouldn't we? Because sometimes we allow ourselves to be divided or to end up at odds over much, much smaller things than that controversy. Now, they had biblical roots after all, didn't they? 1,500 years of tradition. And yet Paul could put that to one side and say, there's something here that is far, far, far more important than uh, picking a side in that squabble. Faith working through love, a new creation. Remember Paul's slogan and make it your own. It's, you will be tempted so many times in life uh, to jump into a fight or a conflict or an argument and to take sides one way or the other Remember what Paul said. Don't buy it. You listen to Paul and you engage with the Father, the Son and the Spirit. That is what God wants you to do. Now we know what happens, don't we, when uh, division or the forces for division begin to take, to get some traction and build some momentum in our midst. There's a failure to see one body and one spirit, the spiritual fundamentals uh, to which the Lord Jesus has called us. And separate networks develop. Distinct events are arranged. Names and labels and party factions emerge. Partisan loyalties develop. Insular thinking starts to take over. We only begin to see our little bubble, our little space. And we neglect uh, the truth and the goodness that is elsewhere uh, in our movement or the wider world. We start to feel spiritually distant from other people and comfortable in our own little zone. We become intolerant of diversity and the difference that is just part of the colourful world that God has made. We start to insist on my way. You know, if I can't have it my way, I'm not going to turn up or perhaps you're not allowed to turn up at an extreme. Committees, which are there to provide for the good of all, they become conflict zones instead of being allowed to focus on constructive and creative work for the good of the whole. Self-righteousness develops, doesn't it? I'm better than you because I have certain positions or certain views or adopt certain practices and my language to you becomes more aggressive and my behaviour too. Uh, Human traditions in which I might see some value, well, now they're religious requirements. You must uh, adhere to them. And a spirit of spiritual elitism develops where, you know, some are better because they think this or do that and some are worse. And the more, the further we grow apart, the more the evils of gossip and rumour and scandal to be, begin to infect and to poison uh, our attitude to other people. We no longer care about the, the truth, but now we think of them in these sort of coloured, tainted terms. And we develop an orthodoxy that might, might actually be factually correct, but it doesn't uh, convey love and care. We we spend our time on theological quibbles. We begin to use money and power in distorted ways to control other people or institutions. And we start to think of division as a solution. It's an answer to a problem that we ourselves have created. It's a necessary thing, not a great evil. You know, we do not want to go there, young people. You know, I'm 57 this year. I'll be honest with you about that. And uh, what that means, and uh, once upon a time I was on the suburban committee, so I've been where you are, and in, say, 40 years I have seen this pattern repeated time and time and time again. It's just, it comes out of the fleshly part of ourselves as human beings, and even the fact that we meet in a, a spiritual or a religious environment doesn't stop it manifesting itself. Right? It's got to be people who stand up and say, we're not going to go there, we're not going to adopt this approach, Uh, to life together in Christ. Instead, we want to take a wholly positive approach. And that's what the apostles were focused on, as we'll see in a moment. They thought that one body and one spirit was a fundamental, and we should always be aiming to achieve that. They sought to unify the different networks and bring them together and connect them, connect people, abandon the name-calling and the labels uh, that uh, divide. Work with Jesus for the good of all, not the good of some. 
Find ways to get close to people spiritually and connect with them and understand why they do the things they do. Develop a large vision. Open up your heart and mind. Embrace diversity. Move forward together with others, even if they are different from you. Allow the people who are doing the hard work of of staging events like this to become constructive and creative. You know, I can tell you for sure that from from the president down to the host to Mitch and the committee, they are, are working so hard to make this a positive and a constructive place to be, where you can come and you can feel safe, you can feel that you can have a great time with your friends. You can be built up spiritually and you've got a chance even to, to outwork yourself lives of service. You can do things for other people or for the good of the whole. That's what they're trying to create. And you want to back them all the way. Find a way to chip in and do your own thing to support them uh, in that mission. Let's value integrity, faith and love. Let's aim for reconciling language and behaviour that brings people together. That's what we want to do. And uh, that's certainly what the apostles were focused on. Let's see the value in human traditions and and respect them in their place. Let's look for ways to diffuse spiritual values through our group, not keep at the province of a few, and focus on truth, honesty, respect and kindness. Prize truth and love in action. Focus on the fundamentals that we hold in common, not the little things where we might have different points of view. Uh, Use money, use power, use resources for good and see unity as an essential thing that we must accomplish, uh, not an uh, an evil. That's what we've got to focus on. And this little dispute here in chapter 6 shows us the potential, even in a community charged with the spirit, Uh, for division. Well, we've got to make sure that that doesn't happen in our day and age either. And so the apostles focus on a solution. They say, well, uh, let's move quickly and propose a solution. And that's exactly what they do. So chapter 6, verse 2, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So you see, they're not saying this is not important. They're saying it's very important and we need to find a solution. But we've got a full-time job. We're out there preaching the word, right? Carrying the message into all the world as Jesus has asked us to do. So what we need are more hands. We need to find seven people and they've got to meet these criteria. You choose them. Right? That's a clever move, isn't it? Right? Here's the congregation who are sort of split down the middle, uh, arguing among themselves and looking at each other sideways and imagining all kinds of prejudices and biases when really, in the end, it was a simple communication problem. They're saying, work together, guys. Here's what we propose. You find seven people who meet these criteria and we'll appoint them uh, over this task. And so that's what they did. Now, why these these three criteria? Well, reputable is the first one, isn't it? You can understand why that would be important in the work they were being asked to do, that you wouldn't want somebody lazy or negligent uh, responsible for this task. You wouldn't want them diverting resources into their own pockets. You wouldn't want them favouring family and friends. They needed to be reputable people who could be trusted. They had to be full of the Spirit, said the Apostles. In other words, we don't just want them to see this as an administrative task. It's not like filing, for example. Right? We need to see this as a spiritual task. And when we hand over the parcel of food and clothing, we want a spiritual message to go with that. So we need people who are full of the spirit. And we need people who are very wise as well. They need to make sensible decisions about how to share out scarce resources and decide who's eligible and who needs what and how to reach people who are a little more distant from Jerusalem. Well, uh, they they had a good look and they came up with seven names that they were happy with and they presented them to the apostles and in verse 6, these they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them and so they were officially consecrated to this work. Now, of these seven who are are listed in in verse 5, and well done, uh, Josiah, for making your way through that list, you'll notice that the first is Stephen. And just like Peter is always at the, he's always the first named whenever the 12 are listed, 
Uh, so Stephen is put at the front of the list because he was such a special person. Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, uh, Luke tells us. And when we look at uh, Luke's description of him, we can see why that is. Now, the first thing we should note about Stephen, his name, his background tells us that he, like the Hellenist widows, is an outsider. Right? Stephen's not from here. He doesn't look like us. He doesn't dress like us. He hasn't been brought up in Jerusalem. He speaks another language. He's an outsider too, isn't he? And yet look at all the positive qualities that Luke lists about him uh, in chapter 6 and chapter 7. He's clearly reputable and wise because he meets those criteria. He's been chosen by the whole ecclesia, so he's obviously you know, widely trusted. He's the most prominent of the seven. And the first thing we're told about him is that he's full of faith and he's full of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, so much is that a part of Stephen's character that four times in two chapters, Luke reminds us, and by the way, Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. And uh, yes, again, Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit. And just as he dies, let me tell you that Stephen is still full of the Holy Spirit. This guy has so much spiritual energy in his tank. It's coming from God, and he's clearly in touch with, uh, with God and with Jesus, and that is charging him up in order to do this work, and as we'll see, much, much more. Later on, uh, Luke says of him, he's full of grace and power. He's doing great wonders and signs. Uh, we know from the record that he had extraordinary scriptural knowledge, and that was hard to get in those days, wasn't it? You know, how much work it would be to go down to the local synagogue. You didn't have your own scrolls. And uh, on, a, on a Friday night, perhaps, you'd pull out the big scrolls and you'd roll your way through and you'd find them. And there's the text in front of you. No concordance, no commentary, right? It's not Stephen's native language. And yet his grasp of scripture was astonishing. So this is a guy who's put serious hours, he's got serious passion, hasn't he, for understanding the scriptures. And he's put in a, a far more work than we would have to do to get the same kind of results. And, and certainly his, his, uh, his knowledge and his understanding is, is extraordinary. He was a highly effective preacher and debater, and we'll get to that in just a moment. He had a personal relationship with Jesus, and he was a forgiving, not a vindictive person. They're, they're, they're sort of hurling boulders at him at the end and he's still praying for them because he wants their salvation. What a remarkable person is Stephen. So he's the focus of these two chapters uh, from Luke. And, you know, uh, if we think about Stephen, as we said, he's outside the social network, he's a nobody. Um, it was only in the very last few days of Jesus' life that any Greeks showed any interest in what Jesus had to say. So Stephen was a recent Christian, uh, not someone who'd been following Jesus from, you know, day zero. And yet for all of that, his spiritual disabilities, or his social disabilities, if you like, became spiritual assets. He stepped up. He did a magnificent job. And he went down in the record, as we see, as a Christian hero on all counts. <coughs> now, I want to encourage you to think about uh, yourself and how you can do the same. But let me first take some contemporary examples, okay? These are probably faces and names that you recognise. Uh, Grace Tain, a, success, a survivor of sexual abuse who fought for the right to discuss her experience publicly. Under Tasmanian law at the time, she wasn't even allowed to talk publicly about what had happened to her, and she changed that law. And she won such recognition for that, for that struggle for, for uh, recognition for survivors of sexual abuse that she was made the Australian of the Year in 2021, and she led a whole new movement pressing for respect and security and equity for women. It's a crucial national discussion that Australia has to have. And Grace Tame started that movement coming from that challenged background. Or take another face that I'm sure you know, Greta Thunberg, a young woman uh, diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder and selective mutism, so not an easy life for her inside her head. But she started by instigating a worldwide school strike 
to galvanise support for climate change action among students. And she's since won numerous international awards for her ongoing pressure that she puts on, like people like President Trump, for example, for whom I have zero time, but nevertheless, a very busy and for a, for a time an important man, um, had to take notice of her tweets. He could not ignore them. She was able to uh, advocate for climate change action to such effect. Or perhaps uh, Dylan Alcott, uh, this year's Australian of the Year, an elite wheelchair tennis and basketball player, won numerous uh, major competitions, an advocate for living a full life as a physically disabled person. Right? He's not allowing his situation to hold him back, is he? It's a platform uh, to create positive change, and that's been recognised with that award. Or well, finally, Nick Vujicic, born in Melbourne with uh, Tetra Amelia syndrome, which means he has no arms or legs. Initially rejected by his parents. Now, he's reconciled to them now, but imagine how tough that would be. To live with the fact that when you were born and you were different, your, your parents walked out of the hospital and walked away. Right? That's tough, isn't it? To start your life like that but now a successful uh, motivational speaker and happily married with four children and has got a business motivating people in the United States. I've seen videos of him addressing school groups, right? Now, you guys are in that stage or maybe a little out, out of it and I know how hardened and cynical you can be. I mean, I'm looking at Daisy here, for example, right? I've seen him move people to tears just by the person he is and what he can say about living a full life, right? These are remarkable people. And each of them in their own way has had to take serious social disabilities and convert them into assets. And we can do the same on a spiritual front. God can do the same for you. And he can take your social or your physical challenges, whatever they are, and he can convert them into spiritual assets. And you need to trust him and to connect with him so that he can find you important and worthwhile things to do and you can give yourself wholly to those tasks. And that's what Stephen did. He didn't sort of sit back and say, well, I'm an outsider here, I didn't create this problem, I'm not from here, I don't speak their language, um, they, don't, they don't include me, I'm on the edges all the time, I'm never invited in, I'm not in their friendship circle. Stephen took his social disabilities and he allowed Jesus to make them spiritual assets and what a difference that made. Well, uh, Stephen and his, uh, the fellow six deacons were consecrated to their role and they went about their work. And look at the impact they had on their community. Look at verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, the fact that Luke slots that in there tells us, doesn't it, that the positive impact of this solution that the apostles put in place and the ecclesia supported 100% and that the power of the seven people who are mentioned in verse 5, the extra energy they created uh, in that movement uh, really had a huge impact in the, in the area around Jerusalem. And even the priests, right, socially so conservative and so conservative religiously, and yet they too are now, a great many of them, are drawn to obedience uh, to the faith. They get baptised, they become believers in Jesus, and they participate in their worship. So it was a successful innovation, wasn't it? And it became a fixture uh, in Christian assemblies. Paul gives advice about deacons, for example, choosing them. And, and women, too, were appointed to the role. It wasn't just a male province. But soon a fierce conflict broke out that was quite personal to Stephen. It's there in verse 9 and 10, isn't it? Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Kyrenians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. So um, Stephen himself is obviously having a big impact on, his, uh, on the Jerusalem world. And there's a group of people in this synagogue who are conservative Jews and they think, enough, we're going to stop this guy. Look at the impact he's having. Right? We're going to do something about this. You've got to find the holes in his argument, talk him down, undermine, erode, unravel his faith in Jesus Christ, uh, white ant the power of his preaching, and then we can stop this movement in its tracks. 
And that's what they tried to do. So they, they, they started challenging Stephen in public places, perhaps in the synagogue itself. And uh, more and more energy, more and more heat was created uh, by this debate. But Stephen's opponents couldn't withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking, verse 10. They couldn't find a hole in his arguments. Uh, they certainly didn't have the scriptural knowledge Stephen had. And they couldn't find a flaw in the logic. Every time they thought they'd scored a victory, Stephen would show them how their assumptions were wrong or their conclusions were invalid. And he could show them again and again how the logic of Israel's history and the, the promises and the prophecies of God uh, all pointed to Jesus Christ, his resurrection and his elevation to power and glory at the right hand of God. And they became more and more and more frustrated. Right? They tried everything they could think of. All their best arguments had been exposed and they were getting nowhere. In fact, the people standing around listening are themselves becoming Christians. And so they take it to the next level, don't they? Verse 11. And this is a tragedy, isn't it? They're sort of stepping, crossing a red line here, aren't they, we would say. It's not just about arguments, you know, a contest of ideas in the public space, trying to work out uh, what's right and what's wrong. Now we're moving into uh, explicitly unethical behaviour. Verse 11. They secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they'd even procured false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place in the law, right? Now, it's not that Stephen had never said anything in that space, but it wasn't everything he talked about. And yet they're making it seem like this guy's an obsessive. He's a fanatic. He gets up in the morning, and as soon as he's knocked back his, his Weepix and his olives, he's out in the street trying to take down this holy place in the law. We've got to stop him. And uh, that's how they made it appear, and that's what made it false witness. And so they laid this charge on Stephen in front of the whole council. Imagine how intimidating that would be, right? Stephen's a brave man, and he knows his stuff. He's tested his arguments many times in debate with these guys. But think about it. You've got, you know, 70, and probably a lot of other people as well, but 70 official members of the Sanhedrin. These are the most powerful lawmakers in the country. They've got the power of life and death in their hands. Uh, they've got, you know, collectively in that room, there's probably a thousand years, and I'm not exaggerating, of Bible study and study of Jewish tradition and the, the law of Moses and how that works out in you know, a million different ways. All of that was present in that room. And then there's just Stephen, no supporters. And false witnesses are having a go. That would be a pretty intimidating and hostile environment, wouldn't it? That's where things are at uh, for Stephen. And so they put this charge in front of the Sanhedrin. If you look at it in verses um, <coughs> 13 and 14, there's a certain structure to it. This man never ceases to speak, they said, words against this holy place, the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the law, right? the, the, the five books of Moses, if you like, that were the foundation uh, for Jewish faith and life. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, the temple, and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Well, that was the charge. And so they laid that on Stephen uh, in the presence of the Sanhedrin. Well, the high priest says to Stephen, chapter 7, verse 1, are these things so? Probably said it a lot more dramatically than that, you know, looking down his, uh, his nose, across his great beard at Stephen. A very intimidating situation indeed. And, and so Stephen begins his defence uh, in chapter 7. Now we're not going to work through that in detail tonight. Uh, we'd be here till midnight. There's a lot of uh, information packed by Stephen into this chapter. Right? He really, really, really knows the Old Testament back to front. And he can pull out stories and promises and prophecies. He can put verses together. And he would have been you know, working this magic, if you like, in front of the Sanhedrin and setting out his case uh, for uh, what God uh, wanted him to do, what, what he was meant to believe and to, and to proclaim uh, to his world. You know, we've got to think about that ourselves, don't we? I mean, we're, none of us are Stevens, right? But all of us have got reasons, I'm sure, for what we believe. And they've got to be first-hand reasons. Right? When I was a kid, 
initially, you know, at school, for example, people might ask me what I believed or, you know, what denomination I was a member of. And the, the answers I gave were all secondhand. They came from my parents or they came from uh, my Sunday school teachers and they might come from a, a speaker that I particularly enjoyed. And, and I would do my best to sort of summarise the reasons that they would give, you know, why the Bible is true and why Jesus is alive and why he will return. But it came to a point in time where I thought, these are not good enough. I've got to have my own reasons. Really? And that's what uh, the Apostle Peter says we need to do. We've got to be ready at all times to give a reason. Right? It doesn't have to be an essay. It doesn't have to be an elaborate or profound argument. But it does have to be your reason why you believe and live as you do. And that requires all of us to think about that, doesn't it? Right? Stephen had put an enormous amount of time into developing his reasons. And certainly, we've got to engage in some reflection ourselves and be able, honestly and authentically, to explain to other people uh, why we live as we do. Well, Stephen it takes almost a whole chapter, chapter 7, verse 2, uh, all the way through to chapter 7 and uh, verse 53. 52 verses um, of, the, of the book of Acts are devoted to Stephen's defence. And while we're not going to go through it in detail, we can pick out a few key themes uh, from what he has to say. The first point that Stephen made, it was in response to the temple, of course, and Jesus did say something like that, didn't he? Remember? John chapter 2, the first Passover. He goes into the temple at Jerusalem and he plaits a small cord of whips and he chases out the people selling calves and lambs and goats for sacrifices and doves and spills the tables of the money changers and they say, what sign do you give us? Because you do these things. And he says, destroy this body, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they thought, what's he putting himself forward as a sorcerer? Right? Knock down this temple and three days, there it is again. It's not what he meant at all, is it? He was going to replace that temple. That would be a, a ruinous heap of stones once the Romans had finished with it. And Jesus was going to replace that because God is worshipped in spirit and truth not in places and temples. And he was going to build a new temple of people in whom God might dwell uh, by the Spirit. That's what Jesus was going to do. So he had said something like that, and I'm sure Stephen would have repeated these words. But the point he makes, and it's a very powerful point, is that God works everywhere. When God called Abraham, he was right over in Babylon. He wasn't here in Jerusalem, and certainly there was no temple there existed for another 1,200 years or more after that date. God didn't need uh, the temple to work in the life of Abraham or in the life of Isaac, Jacob, Joseph uh, uh, and his brothers. He visited Israel in Egypt and took them out, brought them in through Joshua and still there was no temple. They went through the 400 years of the judges. David was king. David wasn't allowed to build a temple. How important is this temple really, says Stephen? And he makes quite a thing of that argument in chapter 7. <coughs> The second key point is that you make so much of your uh, adherence to and obedience to Moses. You're horrified that, um, you know, I'm talking about Jesus of Nazareth changing the customs and me speaking against the law. And look at your history. It's disobedience to those customs and traditions from beginning to end. And in fact, he finishes uh, his defence on that very point. He says, if you look at it closely, you've got a history of rejecting and persecuting those sent to save you from God. It was Joseph first, wasn't it, right? And only the second time, decades later, uh, did you accept Joseph as your saviour. When Moses came the first time, you sent him packing out into the desert. And even when he returned and, and led you out of Egypt into the wilderness, oh, how many times did you talk about abandoning Moses and going back to Egypt? You didn't uh, obey him even then. And time and time again, God has sent messengers to you and you have rejected and persecuted them. And the grand climax, you've done it to the righteous one, to Jesus. And then finally, although Stephen really didn't get to make this point strongly, you can see where he was going, but he was cut off before he could really finish what he had to say, was an appeal to the nation. You've got to break this pattern, guys. We can't go through, this has been 1,500 years now, we can't keep going with this pattern of disobedience. You really need to open your hearts to what God is doing and accept his offer of rescue, healing and transformation 
or worse trouble will follow. Well, Stephen never really got to say that, uh, but that was uh, where his message was leading. Well, um, look at their reaction. Turn over to the end of chapter 7, and they, they are just infuriated, aren't they? Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. You know, they were just so angry. They were, you know, there were splinters and chips coming off teeth. Everyone was a dentist nightmare. But they were so angry uh, about what Stephen was saying to them, and they were, it was only made worse uh, by the two things that he said. He, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That was his vision. It's an astonishing thing, isn't it? That at that moment, God gave Stephen that extra surge of confidence and hope, if you like, by opening heaven to him and enabling him to see in, in some kind of visionary way his own glorious presence there, and standing beside him on his right hand, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Now, of course, that was a, a promise of a fulfilment, wasn't it? Like um, Jesus himself had said uh, to these same people when he was arrayed before the Sanhedrin, he'd said, you will see the Son of Man uh, seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And they said, you know, what need we of any further witnesses? You've heard him yourself. This is blasphemy enough. Like, kill him, kill him, kill him. That was their reaction then. And when Stephen says this again, uh, they react similarly. And now as he sees Jesus, if you like, on his feet, poised uh, to realise this promise and bring the power and glory of God in, in judgment on his people and their ultimate salvation, they are just infuriated. Verse 57, you think it couldn't go up another level, but it does. They cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They weren't just pelting pebbles at him either. Like great boulders trying to crush his skeletal system and his internal organs and, and his hair. That's how he would have died in, in agony because it was such a horrific way uh, for people to die. And yet in the middle of that chaos... As Stephen's getting dragged along and battered with these huge rocks, he finds time to pray. Lord Jesus, he says, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It's just that beautiful metaphor, isn't it, of, of someone slipping into something peaceful and quiet and restful where he waits for uh, the resurrection at the hands of his Lord. What an astonishing uh, series of events this was. We're told that there was a, a person standing by. Look at the end of verse 58. The witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. If we go to the next chapter in verse 1, 8 verse 1, Saul approved of his execution. We we'll read in verse 3, Saul was ravaging the ecclesia. So, you know, Saul himself, he played some kind of role in this event, but certainly it, it triggered him and he went on this crazy manic campaign to try and suppress uh, the Christian movement uh, completely. And on Sundays he was breaking into house after house, busting up their meetings and dragging people off to prisons. He, he went to foreign cities multiple times, barging into the synagogues on the Saturday in the middle of the service and grabbing people who were identified as Christians and dragging them back to Jerusalem for punishment. It was manic. The words that are used of it are of a madman later on in the book of Acts. Uh, it, it really triggered this rage in Saul uh, that he could not, uh, that, that, that just drove him on and perhaps triggered a little by uh, what Stephen had had to say. You know, Saul himself was certainly, or Paul, was certainly haunted by the role he played in the death of Stephen. There was a time only a few years later when he was, uh, he'd come back to Jerusalem just for 15 days and he was in the temple praying. He was on his knees and he saw a vision of Jesus standing next to him. Jesus said, Paul, I want you to leave the city. You've got a job to do. Get out there and carry the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul argues back. He says, Lord, and these words occur, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. Surely they're going to listen to me. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. 
In other passages, he talks about the way he persecuted the ecclesia of God. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. His pride and his rage drove him on uh, to these great excesses. And uh, Stephen haunted him even years later. You know, Stephen's name is a word in the Greek language. But we know that you know, names can have these traditional meanings, can't they? You can go on Wikipedia and you, you can look up the etymology of your name and it'll probably tell you it's from the Nordic or the Irish or the you know, Hawaiian or wherever you come from and it'll explain you know, where, where, that, where that name came from and, and what it means. It's just a curiosity, really. But Stephen's name is an actual Greek word and it refers to the crown, not those enormous, bulky Crowns, you know, have to be lifted onto the head of the reigning monarch by a crane. You know, they're made of solid gold and embedded with, you know, millions of dollars worth of precious stones. It's not that kind of crown. That's called a diadem in scripture. And it's not a tiara either. It's a wreath. It's a gold wreath or a laurel wreath uh, that was worn, like, for example, this young man uh, in this um, painting, which is taken from a, an Egyptian mummy, actually, in Greco-Roman times. But Stephen would have looked something like this. And if he had worn a wreath, uh, then it would have looked something like that. So you can see uh, what it represents. And, of course, in the scriptures, that's a figure, isn't it, for life, the crown of life, or the crown of righteousness, or the crown of victory that's worn by the successful athlete. Now, just think about the fact that Paul's going to use this word in his writings, and here he is, perhaps in, in the letter to the, the Thessalonians or the Philippians, riding along, and all of a sudden he gets to the where he says, you are my Stephanos. What do you think he'd be thinking? That would have to bring all those memories back to life, wouldn't it? It's almost like the ghost of Stephen would be there and would rear up in his mind and he would think about those terrible things he'd done before and it would drive him on to reach out and embrace warmly uh, his brothers and sisters, and that's why he calls them his crown and his joy. When he went to Greece, the very first people he, he converted and baptised was a, a man called Stephanus and his household. I wonder why he was a target for Paul, why he zeroed in on him, and why at the end of his life uh, he wanted that crown of life or crown of righteousness that only the Lord could give him. Just have a look at a couple of these passages in particular. Perhaps just focus on the, the one on the right-hand side. I think the one on the, the left is an echo of Stephen's vision, actually. And when Paul himself, you know, the veil was whipped away and he was able to see Jesus as he really was, he said, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's almost a description, isn't it, of Stephen's last vision. And Paul could only get to that point when he abandoned all those sort of Judaist, legalist assumptions uh, that had driven him to take Stephen's life. He had to, to, to understand the argument from Stephen's point of view and fully commit to that faith in order to experience that transformation uh, which Stephen had. But look at, this, look at the second column on the right. These are almost Paul's last words. He says in 2nd of Timothy, he says to Timothy, you better come quickly. It's urgent. Try to get here before winter because, you know, I've been convicted. The clock is ticking. It's only a matter of time before soldiers knock on the dungeon door and they, they drag me out uh, on the Appian Way outside of Rome to a particular spot and there they're going to take off my head. The clock is ticking, Timothy. You better get here fast if you want to say goodbye. That's the context of 2nd of Timothy. And he says to Timothy in that letter, he says, I have fought the good fight. This is like the wrestling match for which you would win a wreath or a crown in Greco-Roman times. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the wreath of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Why do you think he adds that second bit, right? Remember, it was Stephen's last vision, wasn't it? He saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He loved his appearing. And I'm sure Paul was triggered by the use of his name uh, to add that second phrase. 
Well, he had a phenomenal influence on, on Paul. In fact, we can track it all the way through Paul's view of Israel, his primary focus on, on converting the Jewish people, his evangelistic method, the way he went about his preaching, the content of his message, uh, his own experience, which, which mimicked that of Stephen. He was beaten and stoned numerous times by his fellow Jews and his desire to sacrifice himself to save Israel. All of that was inspired by Stephen. Phenomenal impact that this man had. And it's crazy to think about it, isn't it? Because the last Stephen knew, Stephen was fixed on the Lord Jesus. That's what got him through that last few agonising minutes. If he'd glanced sideways at, at Saul, what would he have seen? Right? Eyes full of hate and pride. He would not have died thinking, this guy's a, a convert. But within a year or two, uh, Saul, uh, Paul had become uh, one of the great advocates for the very faith for which he put Stephen to death. What, a, what an impact he had. Let's just pick out a few key points to finish off with tonight. Our Christianity, our faith is meant to be socially inclusive. Right? Don't allow yourself uh, to get locked into a network and leave other people out. Extend yourself to others. Uh, look around, reach out and connect. Now that's something you can start to do tonight, isn't it? Right, this hall's full, filled with 150 people. Some of them you know well. Some of them you probably know their name. Others you've never spoken to in your life, you're not even sure who they are. It's not going to be hard for you just once tonight to reach out to someone you don't know or someone who's standing on the edge of the crowd just to take a step back, make a space, invite them in. So easy, isn't it? You can practice that tonight. Uh, and that can start you on a life of reaching out to and including other people. Beware the human potential for division. Embrace the divine potential for unity. We spoke about that at length early in the night. The Lord Jesus himself came uh, to serve, not to rule. It's like Stephen. Put your hand up when there's opportunities to serve in practical ways. Again, tonight that's easy, isn't it? How hard can it be when you see a couple of bowls, of, you know, the, the debris of chips left behind by the seagulls on a table out the back? You can pick up those two bowls and walk them to the ser servery two metres away. Anyone can do that, right? Anyone can, when you see the tables being packed up, reach out and pack up a table yourself and put it away. You don't have to do everything. But you can pitch in and make a small contribution and that always makes a difference, doesn't it? Learn to serve. Jesus can make outsiders central to his purpose, like he did with Stephen. Draw on the power of the Spirit to turn your social challenges into spiritual assets. Think about the phenomenal knowledge of the Scriptures that Stephen had. Careful study of the Scriptures helps us in proclaiming and explaining our faith, as well as guiding our life. Invest every day in building your understanding. Whatever you think, God is bigger. He works wherever, whenever, However, with whoever he pleases. Look for him. Don't, do not limit God. He's at work in a whole lot of places that you, you're not even conscious of tonight. Understand that he works at that scale and think of him like that and open your heart and mind to that larger purpose of salvation that he has. Uh, I suppose a lesson from Paul more than Stephen, we must not allow past mistakes to hold us back. Draw on the energy of regret to do something big. But finishing with Stephen, God can turn apparent defeat, a shattered, broken body. The silencing of his voice, the end of his message, it appeared. You know, evil and hatred had won. Had they? It's God who turned that apparent defeat into real victory, isn't it? So every day when we get up in the morning, let's remember that that's the God that we worship, that we walk with every day, and he can do the same for us. Look to his power every day. Thank you.